Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's episode of Bench Warmers. I'm your boy Benjamin, rocking an orange Cassidy shirt today. Uh <laughs> yeah, exactly. JM1620, what is going on? Good morning to you. Flashfire. Yeah, I'm definitely still in the sleep mode myself. Uh, did not get a lot of sleep last night. But anyway, if you guys are not able to catch the show live this week, we are obviously going to have the show on YouTube at Hat Hyphen Club. Be sure to subscribe to us, which is a fancy word for follow. Give us a like if you like what you see. Elk Dot in the house and Logan Herrera saying in the form of good morning, Vietnam. Good morning, Benjamin. Um, I'm moving at a little bit slower pace than usual. Um, I'm not blaming this on my wife, but she had to pull the uh, 6 p.m. to 4 in the morning shift. And so, uh, yeah, I, I was still awake by the time she got home this morning. So uh, we'll see how the show goes today. Might be a little bit shorter than usual, but I'll be honest, there's really not a lot going on in sports right now. And maybe that's my fault for not adding some more WNBA into this mix. My bad on that one. Um, but thank you. I, I enjoy this hat very much. Haven't worn it a long time. Of course, it is a Boston Red Sox from the Big Ben's Knockouts collection that came out a few years ago. And so felt like it was very fitting to throw this one on. It's got a B on it for bench warmers. But anyway, um, Elk Dot, thank you. Of course, I can't really talk about that one right now just because it hasn't entered the collection as of yet it's paid for there is a shipping notification but hopefully by the end of the week it'll be here especially considering the fact that this particular jersey is coming from san jose uh from a guy who i've bought a jersey from before so he's a quick shipper thank god for that uh but yeah probably get it if maybe tomorrow actually which would be pretty dope but either way I will have it for Monday for you guys. Uh, Flashfire says, it's funny and frustrating when you seem to wake up around the same time no matter when you go to sleep. Yeah. <sighs> That's how my life is, man. Always just waking up early and going to bed late. Uh, it's almost as if, uh, you know, I'm living in Vegas 24 hours a day. My God. Uh, Logan Herrera says, we're here to report on all sports, men's or women's, mostly professional leagues based out of USA or England. Yeah, for the most part. I mean, that's my fault for not really going in depth on to uh, cricket, which is a very fascinating game. Uh, I've been to a couple of matches here in the States, and I don't fully understand it, I'll be honest. And maybe that's my fault. Maybe I need to expand upon it more. But anyway, always start the show, of course, with the latest jersey pickups. Um, only two to show off this week, but I've got a ton, ton that I've scooped up over the last week that will hopefully be coming in later this week, if not the middle of next week. And by a ton, I mean, I've got like eight or nine in route right now, which is kind of wild. But um, for one player in particular, there's a little bit of a theme that I did unintentionally. But once they roll in, I'll let you guys know. Best of AZ and Just Shady G. Just Shady G. What's going on? Y'all haven't missed much. Just talking about how sleepy I am. But anyway, uh, first up, and this one's got kind of a sad story behind it as well, but uh, not particularly because of who this player is, but kind of a sad story alone because John Stockton is, he's a bit out there these days. But anyway, old school Utah Jazz purple John Stockton just arrived. Um, I haven't talked about this much in regard to, so back in 96, when the Utah Jazz changed from these old school uniforms to the mountain logos, my dad was on a business trip in Utah and went by a fan store, which unfortunately is owned by Lids these days. Um, and, you know, when they made the uniform switch, usually champion jerseys would go on sale for, for the older styles. So my dad had originally picked up this one in particular in a size 44 because at that point in time, I was 13, I was a little bit smaller, and so I could usually, you know, go between a 44 and a 48. I hadn't, I hadn't gotten my full frame yet. So my dad scooped up this one and a Jeff Hornacek. Well, obviously, I've got the size 48 John Stockton right now. It took a long time, actually, in between... Uh, that point in time and now and i had sold my 40 size 44 like eh, it's seven or eight years ago i want to say because i ended up picking up the white version of the john stockton for this one but anyway 
So I still had the Jeff Hornacek. But the Hornacek was a uh, was a size 44 and never came across a replacement for it. So a couple months ago, there was a jersey collector in Spain who, by coincidence, had a size 44 Jeff Hornacek. Awesome. And he was looking for a size 44. So it's like, okay, cool. Let's let's trade. So um, he mailed his out to me. I got the tracking. Or no, 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 no. Sorry. He mailed his out to me. And for whatever reason, I never thought about asking for tracking or whatever. It's kind of figured it's going to show up when it shows up. And I sent him mine like the next day. Gave him the tracking number and everything like that. So there we go. So flash forward a few weeks from that point, and, you know, I've gone on the road, I've gone to Vegas, I've gone to Houston, gone to LA, you know, something on that line. So finally I hit him up and I was just like, hey man, um, I never asked you for this, but do you have the tracking number by any chance? And he's like, oh, well, I'm actually kind of surprised it hasn't shown up by now, but here you go. So I look up the tracking and according to the tracking number, it had been delivered three days prior to me asking for the tracking number. Well, I check my mailbox pretty regularly and I always check for packages. And then one of my next door neighbors, anytime I get a package, he'll throw it on my porch if I'm not there. And I do the same courtesy for him. Never showed up, but it was marked as delivered. At least it was marked as delivered in my zip code. So uh, this was back in may still hasn't shown up so there was a size 48 jeff hornacek old school utah jazz in purple somewhere in oakland that's supposed to be in my possession and it is in somebody else's possession so and there's nothing that can be done about it so sucks but dude pal of course got the one i sent him so i know he's stoked i am not so Still on the hunt now again for a retro Jeff Hornacek Utah Jazz jersey. So anyway, um, and then the second one. So best of AZ asked the question, are there any? I mean, for the most part, I mean, feed, feed cut up there for a second. So the great thing about champion jerseys is they are insanely hard to fake or make replicas of, or, you know, counterfeit, whatever you want to call it. So um, just because of the the lining on the side, the actual material of the, the mesh jersey, polyester, et cetera, like they are hard to duplicate. And uh, which is great because you really don't see that many fakes on the market. I have one. Um, actually, it's sitting next to me. So for next Monday... I will bring this up as far as the discussion. I feel like I showed this one off before, like months and months ago, because it's a uh, Mike Bibby Sacramento Kings that I have, and I have since gotten like the actual one. So next Monday, or when I the next time I do the show, hopefully Monday, <clears throat> might be Tuesday morning again. I'll, I'll show you guys the difference between a legit one and a fake one, etc. Uh, but yeah, they are insanely hard to to fake, and so usually I'm pretty good uh but anyway brother bishop what's going on so anyway but this is the second one that i that that came in the mail and when we talk about insanely rare jerseys this one is definitely top of the list i have one of these technically <clears throat> but what it was was i found the jersey it was blank on the back so team name uniform number are on the front back was blank send it off to a guy in LA. His name is Curtis Linden. Um, and I had him, you know, put the last name and the number on the back. Great. Well, since then, I mean, this is years ago. This is like during COVID that I, that I sent these off and over time, and especially going through the wash, because when I wash them, put them inside out, cold water, hang them in the dry, never throw them in the dryer. This is why, a lot of champion jerseys, you know, will crack and fade and whatever. It's because people throw them in the dryer, which you're not supposed to do. So even though I've been, you know, playing it safe and everything like that, for whatever reason, the type of vinyl that he was using in regard to his printing was starting to peel off. So 
I haven't worn it in a very long time. I still have it, obviously. It's sitting behind me. But, you know, I came across this one because, oh, it's an actual, legit, completely done one from back in the day. Um, I can't believe I found this. And so I had to pull the trigger on it. It's a little bit more faded than I wanted to, but it's fine. It's a little bit bigger than I wanted to. That's fine. I can wear it during the winter over a hooded sweatshirt. But anyway, here it is. It is a Dirk Nowitzki Dallas Mavericks rookie jersey in a double X. So as you can see, you can you can kind of see like the Nowitzki and everything like that. It's a little bit more faded, but you can still read it. And especially if I'm wearing like a white hooded sweatshirt underneath, I'm in good shape. So, yep. It's a little monstrous. Like I said, it's a size 52. There it is. There's the jock tag to prove that. So either way, pretty solid find, pretty rare find on top of which too. So I have no problem having the one that's slightly peeling off, but I've got a you know legit one, obviously completely done here in my position. Uh, where Grambo at? Oh no! <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, that's it. Those are the only two that I've gotten so far. Uh, like I said, I've got a bunch coming in the mail. Most of which are going to be showing up later this week. So when we do the show next next week, I'll have a lot to show off. Plus, I'll show you the the difference was between a a fake and a legit Mike Bibby Sacramento Kings that I have in my collection to answer uh, Mr. Uh, Best of AZ's question. So anyway. On with the rest of the show. I don't know if you guys knew this, but uh, it is soccer season again, and especially in the English Premier League, where betters and gamblers alike, of course, are taking Man City and Arsenal to the top of the table. Which one is it going to be? This is how it's gone for the last two seasons. Uh, and, of course, the uh, championship deciding on the uh, last week of the season between the two weeks, back-to-back -back years. Uh, pretty impressive stuff right there. Oh, Logan Herrera says, sounds like an excuse to come to Dallas in January. It's not a bad, actually. I need So, hold on. I'm going to take this down. So, one thing I need to do is go to San Antonio. My family lives there. Like, my dad and stepmom live there. My sister and her family live there. I need to go to San Antonio and visit them at some point in time. Because I haven't been there since my sister got married. And that was back in, oh, my God, 2015, 2016. So. I got to be a better family member in regard to that. So I'm kind of banking on going sometime, hopefully before the year is over. But if it's like January, it's definitely going to be during basketball season because I would like to go to a Spurs game. And obviously I got a ton of Spurs jerseys to rock during that. Uh, but more than likely what I'll do is look into when the Pacers are going there so I can catch uh, the Pacers on the road. So uh, Flashfire says I'm playing on Warriors Blazers opening night. But that's an easy trip. Yes, it is. Also, in regard to the Pacers, uh, if you guys didn't know this, and I'm actually super stoked about this, in December, December 22nd and 23rd to be exact, the 22nd, Pacers are in Sacramento. The 23rd, Pacers are in San Francisco. So getting a nice little back-to-back -back roadie uh, with my Pacers. So that's going to be exciting for the season. Not to mention the fact that the NBA All-Star Game is in San Francisco this season. So. Gotta go, gotta go. All right, anyway, soccer. Brother Bishop, I know you're a Gunners guy. I am not. I am a Chelsea Blue, of course. And uh, there's going to be some disappointing news for anybody who's a Chelsea fan before this show is over, of course. But anyway, uh, this is one of the greatest times of the year when the English Premier League starts back up. And especially during a time when Major League Soccer is still on hiatus, at least until this upcoming weekend. Um I know the Olympics and stuff had a lot to do with this, but there's just always that weird month long break in like the dead middle of the season for uh, major league soccer where they take time off. And so it's just like, all right, cool, whatever. Uh, Flashfire says, looks like Pacers at Mavs Monday, November 4th. Hmm. Well, if they're in Dallas, that means they got to be going to Houston or San Antonio not too long after that. All right. Well, I got a, I got some research to do on that one. So anyway, uh, but yeah, as I'd said, <clears throat> Gunners and Man City duking it out the last two years for the top of the table. And of course, Man City winning multiple years in a row in regard to the premiership cha uh, championship title. Uh, 
Logan Ursa, speaking of Pacers Spurs, they play in Paris. I'll be damned. Okay, I really need to look more into the schedule. Because, I mean, it just came out not too long ago. So, Ugh. anyway. Um, here's the shakedown of how week one in the Premier League went. Uh, first game that was played was Man United versus Fulham at Old Trafford. Now, if you guys don't remember from last season, Fulham pulled a massive upset win that I predicted on that random ass five leg parlay at a, you know, that one time I was in Vegas and I cashed out way too early. I wimped out in the early stages um, and also not fully realizing when I picked Fulham to beat Man United at Old Trafford. Uh, it would have been the first victory that Fulham had over Man United since like 1987. Didn't know that, but I still pulled it out of my ass and it still came true. Um, if I had stuck to my guns, I probably would have cashed out with a hell of a lot more money than the 15 bucks that I did. But you know what? I went in for five, left with 15. I'll call that a win. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Man United, of course, getting the quick revenge to start the Premier League season with the three points in hand over Fulham. Uh, moving on into Liverpool versus Ipswich Town. Of course, Ipswich Town moving up in the reverse relegation. Pro uh, so they get promoted. Sorry, that was the word I was looking for. Reverse relegation promotion. Uh, but getting blanked by Liverpool, of course. Mo Salah with the 65th minute goal to really seal the deal for them. Uh, Ipswich Town getting blanked in their first run back in the premier league uh arsenal there you go brother bishop two nothing victory over wolverhampton uh bukaya saka and kyle havertz of course scoring two goals for them uh this is the game i kind of wanted to focus on everton and brighton now i picked brighton to win this week uh in regard to ben's bets from ben's bets from the previous show I just didn't realize it was going to be this bad of a beating. And I didn't watch the match, but I went back and watched like the 15 minute condensed version, cut all the highlights and whatever. And if you guys forgot or haven't been paying attention to the Premier League last season, Everton, of course, took a 10 point deduction, uh, still avoided relegations, thank God. Um, but didn't really do much to improve themselves going into this season, which is super unfortunate, unless you're a Liverpool fan, because that, of course, is the Derby. Um, and Everton, of course, is in Liverpool. So my beef with this comes with my England fandom, because arguably one of the best players on England is Jordan Pickford, the goalkeeper, and has been progressively becoming the greatest goalkeeper in England national team history over the last few tournaments. Now, the weird part about this is you look at this score. Jordan Pickford, of course, did start the game in goal for Everton and three goals were allowed. Well, the biggest issue, or at least the one thing I can say, especially after looking at the highlights, is two of those goals were not Pickford's fault. It was a lapse in defense by Everton, which of course led to easy goals by Brighton. Now, the third goal that was scored uh, by Andringa, that one I could say Pickford was out of place, couldn't see the ball. That's kind of his own fault. Um, but either way, if there is one thing that I would love before the season is over, which I don't even know if it's possible anymore because I can't remember when the transfer window begins and ends. Isn't it around January or something like that, But or November? But either way. If there is one thing that I would love to see before this season is over, get Jordan Pickford the fuck out of Everton because, my God, he is hands down the best player on that team, and his talent is just getting wasted there. And, you know, if you watch a lot of England games like I do, Jordan Pickford is a bit of a hothead. He's always pushing his defenders to, to play a little bit harder, get in position a little bit quicker, et cetera. And so you got to imagine – you know, the explosiveness that he shows during the national team games. Um, dude, it's like 20 fold when Everton plays. And it is so sad and so depressing to watch. So Jordan Pickford, I love you, brother. I, I, I wish and hope for better things for you. Uh, and yes, that is how I really feel, Stephen. 
Anyway, uh, moving on, Newcastle, 1-0 victory over Southampton. No real surprise there. Like, I knew Newcastle was going to win this match, but I also had a feeling it was going to be by a very minimal score. Even, you know, with a man down in the 28th minute and still being able to score in the 45th, pretty impressive. Um, eh, it's Southampton. So, I mean, Newcastle was going to get this win regardless. Uh, Nottingham Forest and Bournemouth, no surprise here. One-one draw. Nottingham, you know, not the not the most premier of goal scoring squads, and neither is Bournemouth. But both teams are just destined to draw almost every goddamn week. So, no real surprise here. Uh, Aston Villa getting their promotion to Champions League at the end of last season by finishing fourth in the Premiership. Uh, off to a solid start, 2-1 victory over West Ham. But West Ham, of course, is going to be that hit-or-miss team from London, as they are every year. Uh, they're either going to start off hot and uh, finish terribly, or they're going to start terribly and finish absolutely hot. So, as you can see right now, at least they scored. At least they scored via penalty. Um, but so far, off to a shaky start. I know it's only one game in. But so what? It's still West Ham. And if it, it's a squad that probably should do better than they actually do year after year. Um, this one kind of caught me off guard. Like if I was if I put a parlay together, I probably would have taken Crystal Palace over Brentford. And the main reason why is based on how Crystal Palace finished their season last year. I mean, they were averaging what? Three goals a game over like their last six. And I mean, they had a few games where it's just like, oh, yeah, five nil five to two, whatever. I mean, they were just a, a very efficient goal scoring squad. And so starting off the season, I mean, I'm not saying Brentford is bad or anything like that. I mean, they're a good middle of the road, top 12 team, but I don't know. I was kind of expecting a little bit more out of Crystal Palace for, for week one, at least, but I don't know. We'll see what the next few games kind of shake out for them. Um, and this of course was the worst fucking game of the week. And, uh, Steven, I feel like you can agree with me on this one. Okay, hold on. Brother Bishop saying, facts, Everton will warm up as a whole mid to late season, but by then way too late. I totally agree with that. And it's this is the one part I, I forgot to mention. Um, you know, when I started following the Premiership, which, of course, you know, the actual name of the Premiership was started about the mid-90s, you know, Everton was always just kind of in there, and especially in, like, the early 2000s. Um, going back to when when Tim Howard was was goalkeeping for them, of course, this is post Man United for him. Like Everton, at least finished like top eight consistently. I feel like, and so to fall on hard times in a non Dusty Roads kind of you know promo package sense. I mean, this is all just kind of self inflicted, much like what's going on in Oakland with the A's. Um, just an ownership group that just does not want to spend the money, but they still want to stay, you know, up in the premiership and, you know, nonsense like this is why you get tacked for. And just doing stupid shit. I'm not, I'm not really surprised to see Everton, the position that they're in. So. Um, and Brother Bishop saying the hammers are always a wild card, which is, yep, exactly what I was. For whatever reason, they're just not. Uh, consistently better, but for whatever reason, was not this week. Uh, Chelsea. And uh, obviously, last week for Flip the Script, I tried to do a little bit of a game changer, try to predict the future. Chelsea, of course, won with me five to four. Uh, it should have been a much uh, wider margin of victory, but it was not. But uh, Ehrlich Tolland, the one guy I was like mainly concerned about the entire time I played uh, the FIFA. What does he have? Like a hundred in the premiership? What the fuck, man? <sighs> this kid's a goddamn phenom just knows how to be in the right place at the right time and just like put that ball in the back of the net like it's impressive but i just really hate the fact that he plays for man city as i know a lot of other people feel the exact same way i do except for man city fans so screw you people 
<laughs> but yeah, Chelsea starting in a hole, not great. Uh, they'll bounce back. They will bounce back. They always do. Uh, and of course, the final game, which took place yesterday, uh, Leicester City back up in the Premiership, which is really good to see, uh, going against Tottenham. And, uh, you know, Jamie Vardy with a, uh, you know, second half goal for, for Leicester. Awesome to see at 37 years old. That is uh, Jamie Vardy. Uh, but of course, Tottenham, once again, a team that should be better than they actually are. I mean, they'll still finish in the top six. Like, let's let's not kid ourselves on that. But Tottenham is always built as a squad that should be a top three team every year. Should not miss Champions League. Um, but occasionally they do. They'll finish like fifth or sixth. And so that's why I feel like Tottenham, yeah, strong contender for top six. They'll get a European championship in some capacity, or at least a tournament out of it is what I mean. Not an actual championship, but a tournament out of it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll see how the rest of the season goes for them. So, but Southside says Chelsea looked better than the start of last season, which I can totally agree with you on that. Um, I definitely got up early. It was an eight 30 West coast start, which was a reasonable time to be awake, not a five 30 AM, which those like games I just absolutely loathe. Um, but yeah, just sitting there in absolute silence and, uh, you know, crying on the inside because Chelsea, cannot take down the top dog first week of the season. That was a bit rough. So uh, brother Bishop says the hot spurs fall from grace in the last couple of seasons has been wild. And I totally agree with that. And I'm not going to put all the blame on Harry Kane for dipping out and going to Bundesliga uh, with Bayern Munich, but I'm also going to partially blame a bit of that. So, because when you're losing on average, about 30 goals a season from this one guy, from the top goal scorer in English national history, national team history. It's kind of a big deal. So here we go. And I know he's getting older, but still. At least 30 goals a season, that was a good thing to happen. Especially when it comes to the table and you got to worry about, you know, goal differential and stuff like that. So to which case... After week one, Brighton on top, Arsenal at the two, Liverpool at the three, Man City at the four, and of course. Else in the top, those are your winners. Uh, nine and ten with Bournemouth and uh, Leicester City, uh, Nottingham Forest and Tottenham all got draws, so at least they got one point each. And then you got the losers, Crystal Palace on down to Everton. Uh, thanks to the goal differential, Chelsea sitting there in 17th spot, just out of the relegation zone. Love it. Um, anyway, moving on into baseball, we are closing in on that time. We got about a month and a half left in the season. Things are starting to get a little bit more interesting for some divisions, for some teams, and for others, they are just widening their, widening their gap on their uh, pretty substantial lead. I know Steven Steve Wright is going to be happy about one of the teams I talk about. But anyway, Yankees back on top in the AL East by a half game over the Orioles. Uh, Red Sox, ah, you know, it's, I'm not going to say they're out of it. I know it's a seven and a half game spread. There's still the wild card, et cetera. But I feel like, yeah, this is going to be Yankees or Orioles to lose, to win. Um I don't feel like the Red Sox are going to compete necessarily for the uh, top dog in the AL East, but for a for a wild card spot, I could definitely see it happening. Uh, but the Rays and the Blue Jays bottoming out 10 and a half back and 15 back respectively in regard to their division spot. I forgot to grab the wild card standings. That's what I forgot. Dang it. Uh, Guardians on a bit of a downturn, uh, having just got swept by the Brewers, which was pretty substantial for them. Um, and, of course, the Twins not capitalizing on an opportunity to take a lead in the division, which they could have easily done, and therefore is allowing the Kansas City Royals to jump back into it. So both of them are tied two and a half back from the top dog spot. Tigers 11 and a half back, and the White Sox first team eliminated from playoff contention this last week. 30 and 96 on the season, 43 games back. My God. You know, actually, I'll move on to it. I'll be, before I continue with the White Sox, let's go to the AOS. 
Um, Astros building up to a five game lead at the top spot for there, which is super unfortunate considering the fact that I feel like we were just talking about last week how the Astros and Mariners were tied for the top spot in AL West, but the Mariners are five games back. Uh, reigning World Series champion Texas Rangers not even playing 500 ball right now, which is nuts. Uh, 11 games back for them. The A's not in last place, one game lead over the Angels. Got to feel bad for Juan, Ron, Ron, Ron Washington out in Anaheim. And so the one thing I was going to say is <clears throat> the A's, of course, performing better than they did last season. Like the A's actually have some pretty solid pieces. I'm going to go into more detail about that in a little bit. But in comparison to where the hell the White Sox are at right now at 30 and 96, unfathomable how much Jerry Reinsdorf just does not give a shit about his team or the fans anymore. It's crazy crazy um brother bishop says remember when the royals won the world series and immediately said nah we ain't trying to play baseball anymore oh yeah that was when david glass still owned the team uh mr glass who of course uh, made all of his money working for walmart so <clears throat> everything you want to know from an economics perspective in baseball and how their payroll worked you can learn everything Um, but they bought the World Series, lost it to the Giants in the uh, with the final out in Game Seven with a runner on third, down one. I mean, that was a pretty impressive series. I mean, not gonna lie, just so happened that Madison Bumgarner just played like a goddamn savage in that series. But then, you know, go back the next year against the Mets, win the World Series, so it all worked out. Like all these economic plans and right times to buy in did actually work for the Royals. Like, I will give them full credit for that. And then, yes, they blew the team up completely after that. But now, now they're back. So I, I, can't, I can't completely dismiss the game plan. And, yes, Glass did sell the team. And so working from top to bottom to rebuild and get your own organization going, like, I get it. Uh, Flashfire says, and the White Sox have had Usher security trying to confiscate negative signs from fans. Yes, they have. Much in the same sense. I'm actually impressed. Not impressed, but I'm surprised the A's haven't had more Ushers do the exact same thing. And especially over this weekend with the uh, the final battle of the Bay that went on. Um, it's nuts, dude. But also, it does not surprise me. Like, at some point, Jerry Reinsdorf is going to be dispatched from this world. And I feel like everybody's going to be a little bit happier for it, especially people on the South side. Um, I'm not trying to insinuate the faster he goes, the better, but I'm also not saying that. Um, <laughs> moving to the national league. Uh, well, actually, let me go, let me go back on this with the Mariners. You guys got Randy or Rosarena. I mean, granted, Randy Rosarena is was supposed to help the Mariners hitting woes. And, of course, Randy is having the worst season of his career. And, you know, after they made the deal, the Mariners started doing pretty well after that. Um, but then that was it. They just kind of, like, peaked. And it's it's really rough to see. Like, for the love of God, the Seattle Mariners are the only team to still have never been to a goddamn World Series. Please fix that. Jerry Depoto, please fix that. I know the trade deadline is coming and gone. And you're optimistic about you know winning 54% of your games, which yeah, you're you've hit your mark on that. Uh, if not, we've still got a few more weeks so, to really hit that mark. But oh my god, for the amount of money that the Mariners have to back them and could make a solid payroll and solid team together, dude. This is just ungodly what they're doing. Jesus. Anyway, National League time. Phillies took a bit of a stumble, you know, since the all-star break, which could have allowed the Braves to catch up, but uh, still only a seven-game lead there. Mets did what they could, uh, game and a half behind the Braves now, so at least, you know, they made some strides. Nationals 17 and a half back, and of course, the Marlins still haven't technically been eliminated from the postseason, but it's looking pretty bleak. Uh, 27 and a half back, 46 and 79 for them. Uh, National League, National League Central Brewers just dominating. Um, still enough time for the Reds to at least get second place, so my standings could kind of shake out almost correctly. 
Um, but the Brewers looking like they're going to run away with it, which I hope to God they do. Um, I just need the Cardinals to fall apart a little bit more. I'd rather the Pirates win a few more games, just finish a little bit higher. And uh, wherever the Cubs finish, I don't care, as long as it's not in the number one spot. Um, and then last but not least, this has been the most intriguing battle down the stretch. I predicted this before the season started. I had said the Dodgers were going to start really hot because they have all this firepower. They have great pitching, um, just absolute tanks uh, in the batter's box. They just got Max Muncy back, et cetera. Um, and they had like a double digit lead for consistently throughout the first half of the season. But here we are in the second half. Padres only three games back. Diamondbacks only four games back. Giants, you know, still fighting for a wild card spot. Respectable, 10 and a half back. Rockies are out. They're in the same position as Marlins. But I got to say, the Padres and Diamondbacks are coming on at the right time. And the Dodgers are falling apart at the least opportune time. But at least from my perspective, I. said the Padres, the Diamondbacks, uh, and then the Giants and, and Rockies, of course, finishing out the season at the bottom. Um, it could still happen. I mean, we got, like I said, we got a month and a half left in the season. And uh, because the fact the Padres and Diamondbacks are playing really good baseball right now at the most opportune time, granted, all three teams are seven and three in their last 10. Um, but, dude, cutting the lead, cutting the lead a little bit more and more each time. Um, <laughs> best of AC says Braves roster falling apart, which they are totally. Uh, Logan Rare says Cubs sneak into a second place finish would be nice. Ah, I mean, I'm okay with it as long as the Brewers are still winning the division by double digits. That's what I'm more concerned about. Um, I don't want it to turn into a situation like a couple years ago where the Cardinals all of a sudden became the best team in baseball in September. And like really cut into that gap that the uh, the Brewers had over them because I mean that was like a double digit lead and I think they got what within like two or three by the time the season ended, and I mean granted Cardinals you know can still get a wild card spot which they might but then again maybe they won't. Um, that's where I'm concerned because Brewers another team on my list that I still need to witness a World Series before I die. Um, Flashfire says, and then you have the three legit contenders in the West. Yes, dude. Uh, I'm actually like really stoked on this and seeing how this pans out. Uh, Best of AZ says, Dimeback still missing some big pieces, but watch out when they come back. I totally agree. Snakes alive, baby. And it'd be really nice to see the fans get back in that stadium because even as, as far as as good as they're playing right now, seeing that stadium still a bit empty is a bit off. So Dimebacks fans, go support the team. Um, Logan Rare says regular season Dodgers some showing some postseason play right now. Yes, they are. And then Logan follows up with Brewers have the division in a virtual lock. Yeah, see, I, I don't want to say that because that's the moment. That's the moment they slip up. And it's like, I don't want to see that. Uh, and Flashfire says, notice how the Padres seem to be a bit better after getting rid of Bob Melvin. I'm actually kind of surprised in that. I, I really thought Bob Melvin was going to like really do a number for the Padres and I'm flabbergasted and especially him jump into the giants and just seeing how poorly they're doing. I don't know, man. I, I had a lot better praise for Bob Melvin, of course, when he was with the A's and what he was able to do in 2012, 13, 14, hell, even 2000 or sorry, 2020. Um, I don't know, man. I just, I don't, I don't, I don't know what's going on here. I, I wish better for him. Love the guy. Really nice guy. And the players seem to dig him, but it's just like, there are moments where it's just like, I don't feel like he understands fully what's going on with the roster or how to manage bullpen. So very strange. Um, and Flashfire says, and the Giants fans are hating Melvin. Seems like a guy who sometimes get a little extra out of players, but still missing something. Totally agree. Uh, it's still a better better person to have managing your team than the previous option. So wherever he's at. Uh, but anyway, I said, I want to talk more about the A's and um, this is it. So I went to the game last.
much better game than I was expecting by the <sighs> ever lacking crowd size, which was created. who clearly just does not give a shit about being in Oakland anymore. Um, it's depressing to see. And that's why I haven't been in games at all this season, really. I've been to, this was my second game of the year. And I went to a couple Oakland Ballers games, actually. And I, I, pri I meant to post photos of those. And, I mean, the crowd size for an independent league team, uh, I went there on a Tuesday. They drew 2,500 fans. Uh, I went there on Friday. They had 3,300 was the announced attendance. And then Saturday, they had like 35 or 3,600 for that game. And I mean, for independent league. And, you know, people have been making jokes about the low attendance and stuff for the A's for like the last decade. And, but I'll be honest with you. I mean, there are some games, and this was a prime example of that, where the ballers are actually outdrawing the A's. I mean, it's a similar situation to if you guys remember this in Chicago with the Blackhawks uh their previous owner who finally who Chicago because he had the mentality of you should and you want to support the Blackhawks you should go to the game you shouldn't watch it on TV it was so ludicrous and then the minor league not an affiliate of the Blackhawks, but it was a minor league team in Chicago, the Chicago Wolves. They were out drawing the Blackhawks for a bit. So a very similar situation. And you know what it took for the Blackhawks to get off the schneid and start putting butts back in the seats? The owner died. Um, and I kid you not, you know, team rebounded. They started signing players, started drafting correctly, et cetera. Won a couple Stanley Cups in the process. And... Once again, going back to my comments about Jerry Reinsdorf, like I'm not advocating that, you know, the quick speed of death should be, you know, brought upon them. But um, I'm also not saying that. So, I mean, it's a cruel thing to say, but at the same time, it's just like it would be a something that would remedy the situation pretty goddamn quick. Um, it's depressing as hell. And, you know, as much as people think that, oh, well, you know, the owner owns the team, it's their team. It's just like, nah, man, we as Oaklanders have supported this team. I mean, I can fairly say for pretty much my entire life. I mean, I've been going to A's game since 1987. And. Just for whatever reason, I always dug the. Uh, but I lost that after the after the 2004 season when they moved to D.C. and became the Nationals. So I really went full time with the A's a bit more, um, like really dedicated full time. I mean, got a goddamn bow tie tattoo with the entire team history um, underneath my collarbone here. But, uh, you know, going through the situation once again, and especially for the in the, the city that I live in, uh, it's tough and it's tough for a lot of people here. And all we want is the team to stay. And we want an ownership group that is willing to, you know, spend and dedicate themselves to the area and dedicate themselves to winning a championship. And Flashfire coming in saying first game for me or first game for him was 1986. Um, so, yeah, we were we were both there. In the in the old school bleachers, back back when the Oakland Coliseum was like one of the most beautiful places to watch a baseball game, it wasn't until the Raiders were allowed to come back and they fucked that entire stadium up by putting that monstrosity in center field. Absolutely hate it. Um, but anyway, the game itself, um, it was good. I mean, like I said, A's won three nothing victory. Uh, the crazy part about it was when I took this photo is at the uh, top of the fourth inning or sorry, bottom of the fourth inning. My apologies. Um, A's had a no hitter <laughs> going on at that point. I'll prove it to you. Uh, bam. Rays with zero hits. Uh, Boyle for the A's had a had a hell of an outing for himself yesterday. The only problem was he kept getting into too many two and two and three and two counts and he burned his arm out a little bit too quickly because, I mean, he was at 100 pitches by the time they took him out, and that was after the fifth inning. 
Um, so we got the win. That was nice. But at the same time, it's like there is that distinct possibility that he could have thrown a no-hitter yesterday. And that would have been a trip to go to because I've only seen one no-hitter in person, and that was back in Miami, back in 2013. Uh, but either way, um, A's played their ass off. And, and I've been saying this for a while that it's just like, you know, the squad they have has a lot of potential. Like, don't get me wrong. Uh, Rooker, Blade had a two run home run yesterday. Mason Miller, of course, got the save yesterday. Uh, pitching is coming around, bats are kind of coming around. Zach Geloff and a bit of a sophomore slump, but now he's hitting over 200 after, after, after yesterday. He went two for three, which is great. Uh, Brent Rooker should have been uh, an all star game, should have been on the all star team. Uh, I feel like we talked about that earlier. Uh, but yeah, dude. Three nothing victory, solid victory for the A's, and solid finish. But uh, the biggest thing for me was I got to go to the game with my friend Travis. And uh, for any of you uh, baseball aficionados or anybody who followed the A's, and especially the 2012 team, which is hands down the greatest team that I ever witnessed. And I mean, granted, I went to games in '89, '88, and '90, and of course the A's won the World Series in '89. And you could arguably say that that was the greatest A's team ever assembled. Dog style of play. Uh, the 2012 team was hands down one of the most uh, resilient and fun teams that I've ever gotten to experience. And um, so Travis Blackley here, uh, former major league pitcher, he pitched for the uh, pitch for the the mayor. I'm going to show you a stat line here in a sec. Mariners, the Giants, uh, the A's, the Rangers, and the Astros um, had a really interesting career um, that I'm going to I'm going to comb through. And I was very specific about this because there was something he had mentioned at the game yesterday when he and I were talking. And I'm putting this out here as a challenge to you guys. If you can, if you can. free hat involved with this i will i will buy you guys figure this answer out because for whatever reason when i was looking this stuff up i could not find the answer i'm usually pretty good about this yeah i'm gonna have to start that part over don't worry uh but anyway this was the first time that he and i had ever been to a game together and i mean this goes back to like all the times i saw him pitch um I brought him voodoo donuts down from Portland back in 2012 before his finals, his last start of the regular season, which was against the. Career that day. Uh, I feel responsible for that. And I feel like a lot of the other players felt the same way because I mean, I brought down like six dozen, uh, <laughs> six boxes of a dozen donuts for the entire team uh all from voodoo donuts back when voodoo donuts was like actually awesome um for that series uh, it was great and all the all the players were super stoked about that one but anyway so here's what i want to get here's what i want to talk about so here's his stat line first game was in 2004 uh with the mariners and uh coincidentally the first time i ever saw him pitch was against the a's in 2004 up in seattle so then there was a gap of time didn't play again until 2007 in the majors. Uh, and then there's another gap of time where he's back in the majors in 2012, of course, with the Giants, only for about four games. Then he got let go. The A's picked him up, and he had the best year of his career. So, like I said, really odd stat lines going on here. Four years of technical service time in the majors uh, between 2004 and 2013. But obviously, you know, Played for the Australian national team for a number of years in the World Baseball Classic. Bummed around the minors for quite a bit of time. So anyway, here's what he had told me. So first game of his career, July 1st against the Texas Rangers. This, of course, was up in Seattle. Um, he got the win. Eight to four win for the Mariners. He recorded his first win as a pitcher on this day. Now, the thing that blew my mind was... He didn't get another, like, he didn't notch another win as a statistic, like an individual win, not necessarily a team win, but an individual win as a pitcher until, where is it at? Nope, 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 right here, June 15th, 
10 to 2 victories over the San Diego Padres. So just shy of eight years in between the two wins. Uh, or sorry, in, eight years in between the first win of his career and the second win of his career. So the question he proposed to me is, what is the longest gap of time in between a pitcher getting their first win in the majors and their second win in the majors? So, because there is a possibility that he is somewhere high on this list. And so this is what I propose to you guys. If you can find out who has the record for the longest gap of time in between a pitcher getting their first win in the majors and their second win, uh, the person who's able to get that to me first, I will give you a hat. I'll buy you a hat. Any hat of your choice. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, that's what I've got going there. Um, but going back to my Voodoo Donut story, as I was talking about, um, this one right here, October 2nd. This was the final series of the season. This is the season, of course, where the A's were picked to finish, not only picked to finish dead last in the division, they were picked to lose 100 games that season and never held on to first place at all. I mean, with the exception of before the season started when everybody is zero and zero, um, the only time they held the number one spot into like by themselves in the AL West was the very last day of the season. So um, that entire stretch, you know, playing the Orioles and then playing the Rangers multiple times. Uh, dude, it was nuts, man. And just seeing the A's just chip away, chip away, chip away and win the division right at the end of the season on the last day of the season. And of course, the Josh Hamilton boner in the outfield. I uh, never heard the place yell as loud as I did, uh, with the exception of when they played the Tigers in uh, games three and four at the Coliseum in the uh, postseason that year. It was nuts. I love that season. Love that team, man. So. Anyway, Flashfire says, I wish I got out of some of those games late in the season. I just wasn't in the cards. Yeah, I <clears> that was when I got let go from Major League Baseball. And I had nothing but time in my hands until school started back up at Oregon. And all the money I made working for MLB, which was actually pretty handsomely. I mean, they paid me like six grand a month. Um, and I was there for just a little over three months. So I had $18,000 that I didn't want, you know, necessarily in my bank account anymore. So I spent the entire season just going to baseball games across the country, hit hit all the A's playoff games as much as I could. Um, I was a crazy year, man. Crazy year. I got so many stories about that, but uh, I'll save more of those for another time. So, uh, but like I said, that's your, uh, that's your guys' assignment for this week. Uh, figure out who has the record for longest gap in between, as a pitcher, first major league win and second major league win. So Travis Blackley, of course, sets the bar pretty high at eight years. <laughs> Just shot two weeks shy of eight years in between. So anyway, uh, here's my Ben Betts. Uh, Ben's bets, Ben's picks, Ben's bets, whatever we want to call them. And... Um, not too shabby last week. The only uh, downfall was the uh, lock of the week, which, of course, was Chelsea losing to Man City. God damn it. Uh, but the Padres definitely beat the Pirates last Tuesday. Uh, the Twins did beat the Rangers on uh, August 16th. And Brighton definitely took down Everton. So I'll take a nice little three for four. It's not bad. So let's see how I do this week. I've got Newcastle, Bournemouth going to a draw this weekend uh plus 280 on that one uh and then uh, my parlay of the week i'm taking an easy one on this one so new york liberty versus the dallas wings which i believe is tonight uh the liberty of course are favored so they're minus 1200 take the win uh, i've got guardians over the yankees uh two days from now so that's going to be on thursday and uh with the mls season kicking back into gear uh, this weekend, I've got the Portland Timbers over St. Louis City SC. So, hopefully there's some winners in there. Um, Southside Seaman Seaver says, is it Paul Schreiber? Now, okay, this did come up. 
Um, because I did look it up and maybe I did have the answer the whole time, but I forgot to look do like a deep dive on the Paul Schreiber uh and his stats and little and what position he played. Because I just kind of took it as oh, he played you know infield, outfield, whatever. And of course, this was what 1912. And he had like a 21 year gap in between when he pl- like when he played. Okay, Logan Rare says Paul has no wins or losses. Yeah, doesn't even have a career win, so it's definitely not him. But there was a I was gonna say there is a a list. Uh, yeah, 1922 to 1943. I knew as soon as I said 1912, I was wrong. It's like I should have said 21, but I would have been closer with with 20. Yeah, with that over 12. So anyway. Um, yeah, I'm really curious to see who, who's able to get this to me. Um, I was going to say either hit me up on discord or hit me up, uh, through DMS or text me. If you have your number, I know a lot of you guys actually do have my phone number. So, uh, hit me up there. If you got the answer, there goes the camera. Anyway, um, hold on. Got to bring the camera back. Got to finish this out. There we go. Um, yeah, and especially for a lot of these guys that had just like massive gap in between, uh, massive gaps of time in between. Um, <laughs> like, yeah, like 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 Paul Schreiber, <laughs> twenty two years in between one game played and then the next time he played in the majors, which is nuts. Um, I mean, yeah, World War One took place, so you could you could blame it on that. Um, I mean, I'm not hating on people going to war. Ted Williams, war hero, baby. Um, <laughs> Hall of Famer for many reasons, uh, just winning at life. But anyway, uh, guys, appreciate you tuning in. I will do better next week when I won't be as tired. Uh, but as always, take it easy, and if you don't, take it sleazy. Hey!